be with our speaker and thank you for ministering to our hearts today. Uh, I feel like we are again here to feast together on wonderful biblical truth. And Lord, we just we thank and praise you for all of that uh, and all the provision and gifts that you've given to us. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn with me, please, first of all, to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews 4, 12. I believe this to be one of the most important verses for the age in which we live. One of the most important verses for believers and for churches in the age in which we presently live. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword as piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrows, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the hearts. Again, we have this relationship that's almost hypostatic, blending the spirit and the soul. We are told in Corinthians, for instance, to test all things. Is that a real tongue or is it just gibberish? Is that a real prophecy, or is it just clairvoyance? Is that a real revelation of the Holy Spirit, or it is what Jeremiah said, the futility and deception of one's own mind? The distinction between charismata and charismania. What is scriptural, what is real, what is authentic, and what is just nonsense? The kind of stuff you see at the... the Bill Johnson, all that stuff with the gold dust and the feathers from angels' wings falling and all those nuts. What's real, what isn't? The first and foremost test is the Word of God. But it can be difficult. The relationship between the soul and spirit can be acutely close. The criminally convicted swindler in Korea, he's a criminally convicted swindler, Yang Yi Chao, wrote a book called The Fourth Dimension, where he basically said your imagination, your subconscious imagination is your spirit. No, it's not. The imagination is a function of the soul, not the spirit. You visualize what you want, and then you use the ha Copeland Hagen word faith formula to speak it into being after you visualize it. Then he said, Hindus and Buddhists have known this for centuries. In his book, now Jesus Christ has shown it to him. What he was teaching is mystical Buddhism. He was teaching Oriental shamanism. There are far bigger visualization cults than his church in the Far East. You go outside the casinos in Macau, that's like the Las Vegas of Asia. They go out there and they pray to the Buddha and they visualize winning at the roulette wheels and stuff. And they visualize the money and they, they pay the little baldy and they buy the incense from the monk and they, they visualize and they go into the casino and they lose anyway, of course. It's all nonsense. This mixture of soul and spirit. I do not know if Yang Yi Chao is a Christian. I just know he teaches Buddhism. He teaches mystical Buddhism by his own admission. People in the West were impressed by the size of his church. Again, if you've been to the Far East, you know there's far bigger visualization cults than his. In any, any way, in any event, let's talk about this division of soul and spirit. It's analogous to the division between bone and marrow osteocytes and erythrocytes, red cells concentrated in large bones like the femur, fibia, tibia. Now, my way with youth, I studied medical science but worked as a pharmacist, all of which is either outdated or forgotten, but I do recall that osteocytes dye stain a yellowish-white <laughs> bone tissue. Marrow dye stains maroon. But where the two come together in the bone, there is a rust-colored strip. Where do the bone cells end? Where do the red cell concentrations begin? Now, this was very important for the treatment of leukemia patients, transplanting the transplantation of marrow. Okay, very important for leukemia patients. Now it's done with a laser, but in my day, it was done with a surgical micrometer, a instrument that could separate the two. Where does one end? Where does one begin? Where does the bone end? Where does the marrow begin? Where, where does the soul, the mind, the consciousness, the emotions end? What's really the spirit in communication with God's spirit? The word of God is the surgical instrument 
that can distinguish between the two. That's the way we need to think of it. It's living because Jesus is alive. Think of the scripture as Jesus in print. The scripture is Jesus in print. Jesus is the scripture incarnate. It's living. And it's active. It's not a dormant book. How does it work? What makes it different than its counterfeits? Now, I wish I could tell you its counterfeits were cults only, like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons. That its counterfeits were aberrational versions of Christianity, such as Roman Catholicism, or liberal Protestantism, or Eastern Orthodoxy. I wish I could tell you that it was always that, or some obviously false religion that attempts to imitate Judeo-Christian faith like Islam. I wish I could say that was what was false. Unfortunately, we live in an age where apostasy has so permeated the church that much of mainstream evangelicism is no longer biblically orthodox. Many Christians are believing things that are fundamentally heterodox, that is unscriptural. Let's begin at the beginning. Living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. I have explained many times the Hebrew concept of znut, harlotry, developed strongly by the prophet Hosea, but used by others such as Amos and Jeremiah, and then picked up in the New Testament and applied to the church, to worldly churches by James, and used by Jesus in his descriptions of spiritual seduction in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 to the seven churches. This idea of harlotry, where marital infidelity is used to illustrate spiritual seduction. Idolatry equals spiritual adultery. Israel was to be God's woman, the church is the bride of Christ, and when she is, or when the people of God are seduced, the apostate church, or apostate Israel as the case may be, is compared to a harlot. Again, these themes are centrally developed in the book of Hosea, although they're strongly reiterated in the New Testament by both Jesus and by James, particularly. Spiritual seduction. Spiritual seduction works the way sexual seduction works. A false love, a false pretense of affection. Somebody is just out to get something out of you, but they pretend to like you. That's how it works. Turn with me, please, to understand the way the harlot seduces to the book of Proverbs. Turn with me to Proverbs. The good woman in chapter one is compared to wisdom, addressed in the female, in the Hebrew, chokhmah. But then we get the seductress. Let's begin in Proverbs 5. Verse 3. For the lips of an adulteress drip honey, smoother than oil is her speech, but in the end she is as bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Notice, spiritual seduction is sharp as a two-edged sword. It's sharp. Her lips drip honey. She knows how to talk. She knows how to seduce. Just think of Mae West, only Mae West was a joke. But you know, hello, big boy. <laughs> seduction illustrates spiritual seduction. She knows how to talk. False religion knows how to seduce the naive. Not only that, but in the last days, this multiplies. Wanting to have their ears tickled, they accumulate false teachers. A con artist will tell you the easiest person to con is a greedy person. <laughs> Who gets sucked in by the money preachers? You know, people get into the love of money. They're the ones who fall prey to the con artist money preachers. Her lips drip oil, smoother than oil. Oh boy, sharp as a two-edged sword. They all have a two-edged sword. The word of God is the Logon. False religions have a pseudo-Logon. Peter uses the term 
pseudo-logon. Now, this is important. Remember, Christ, Jesus, is the logon, the logos. Only the case ending is different than Greek, same word. Christ is the logos, but there's a pseudo-logos, a false word of God. It's a spirit of antichrist on back of it. You understand? It's a false Christ. A false word of God is like a false Christ. Everybody understand what Peter's talking about when he uses the term pseudo-logon. The Koran is a pseudo-logon. The Talmud is a pseudo-logon. It's a false Judaism that denies its own Messiah. Papal encyclicals are a pseudo-logon. The Book of Mormon is a pseudo-logon. They all have a pseudo-logon, but it's sharp. But then there are other pseudo-logons. She's a seductress. The Shack, authored by William B. Young, a man who denies that Jesus died for our sin. He denies substitutionary atonement. He denies propitiation. By his own public confession, he's not by scriptural definition a Christian. There were thousands, thousands, just in the United States, thousands of home groups. Instead of studying the word of God, we're reading the Shack. A pseudo-logon. The purpose-driven lie. A pseudo-logon. The God chasers. A pseudo-logon. There's nothing wrong with the book that uh, the prayer that Jabez prayed, but when you read that book and they turn it into a formula incantation, it's a pseudo-logon. False religion will always have a pseudo-logon. It will try to make you think it's from Jesus and it's compatible with the Word of God. It's a pseudo-logon, and it is sharp. And the people who promote it, their lips drip honey, smoother than oil. They have a kind of anointing, a kind of a counterfeit anointing. The Shemin, the anointing of the Spirit, they have a counterfeit of it. They know how to talk, and they have a pseudo-logon. That's how spiritual seduction works. Sharper than a, sharp as a two-edged sword. If they have something, if the seductress has something sharp as a two-edged sword, we need something that is sharper than a two-edged sword. You understand? We need a better weapon. Hence, Hebrews tells us it's living, active, and sharper. I'll put the Bible against the Koran any day. I had a nice lady in England, lovely lady, but she was into the Kenneth Hagin money thing. She thought it was scriptural. She said, what's wrong with it? She had all of his books. I said, take any book off the shelf at random. She takes one out. I said, open to any page at random. She opens to a page and says, faith sees the answer. I showed her in the scripture, we walk by faith, not by sight. Which do you believe? <laughs> it's sharp. You need something sharper or you're going to be seduced. Is there a need to refute error? Absolutely. But remember, the first and foremost defense against error is always a knowledge of the truth. If people were taught right doctrine, they would not be so vulnerable to these seductions. They would know for themselves what's wrong with Bill Johnson and the emergent church that the God is a blue genie. You know, they know why this stuff is wrong. So let's begin. Chapter 5. Verse 5 Her feet go down to death. To Sheol. She doesn't ponder the path of life. Her ways are unstable. She doesn't know it. Now, sons, listen to me. Do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her. Do not go near to the door of her church. Keep away from the vineyard movement. Keep away from lunatic churches with lunatic doctrines. Don't go near the door. Notice it points to the young. All these sex scandals and financial scandals in Australia with Hillsong. The biggest leader. Public on television. Unbelievable stuff. Disgusting stuff. Frank Houston, the father of Hillsong homosexual pedophile. His son gets caught protecting him. Brian Houston, Bobby Houston, Christian women love sex. Don't even go there. It's disgusting. 
It's all based on sensuality and sexuality, not any biblical idea of marital intimacy. On top of the financial scandals, who, who gets the young, the young? Believe me, the world will always have better rock concerts. The world will always be better at doing worldly things than the church. We are not called to compete with the world on the world's terms. By all means, bring the gospel into the world, but do not bring the world into the gospel. It doesn't work. It's only going to dilute and seduce. Let us look. Keep your way far from her, lest you give your vigor to others and your years to the cruel one. What happened to Samson? Spiritual seduction will do to us what it did to Samson. The church has no strength in the Western world. They can't stop same-sex marriage or abortion. They're going along with it. You've got major evangelical leaders like Campola going along with this stuff. Chapter 6, verse 24, to keep your eye from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress, don't desire her beauty. On account of a harlotry, one's reduced to a loaf of bread. <laughs> Chapter 7, say to wisdom, you're my sister, to understanding, you're my intimate friend. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye, that they may keep you from an adulteress, from the foreigner who flatters with her words. They flatter people. That's one of the ways they get people in. Oh, you're so special. <laughs> yeah, we're all, we're so special because every one of us is a specimen of ragged filth before a holy, perfect maker who loved us so much anyway that he became a man to take our sin. That's what makes us special. Nothing else. Being the undeserved beneficiaries of God's grace, that makes us special. Nothing else. For at my window of my house I looked through the lattice. I saw among the naive, I discerned among the youths, a young man lacking sense. Passing through the street near a corner, he takes the way to a house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the middle of the night, in the darkness. Remember, he's coming like a thief in the night. The bridegroom comes for the bride in the night. Song of Solomon, he comes in the night. Matthew 25, he comes in the night. Is he coming in the second watch of the night or the third? Watchman, watchman, how far is the night? Thief in the night. It gets very dark at the end of the age and spiritual seduction increases exponentially. Behold, a woman comes to meet him dressed as a harlot, cunning of heart. She's boisterous and rebellious. Her feet do not remain at home. She doesn't stick to biblical teaching. She's in the streets and the square, lurks every corner. She seizes him and kisses him. Now, is this talking about a literal prostitute? Of course it is. That's obvious. But we interpret the Old Testament in light of the New. Jesus took this typology and adopted it to explain spiritual seduction, didn't he? And look at this. Verse 16, I've spread my couch with coverings, with the colored linens of Egypt, the world. I've sprinkled my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Let us drink our... Fill of love till morning. <laughs> now look at verse 19. The man's not at home. He's gone on a long journey. He's taken a bag of money with him that full moon he will come. <laughs> she knows he's coming back. She knows he's coming back. What did he warn about in Matthew 24? What does Paul, don't let that day overtake you like a thief. The good and faithful servant says, my master is delayed. He begins to beat the fellow servants. <laughs> you get into the whole heavy shepherding thing and the sexploitation, exploitation. Just, these things increase. They're banking on the fact he's not coming back. Or it's something you have to think about. That's why Rick Warren teaches people. He teaches people. Avoid end time prophecy. It's a diversion, he says. He directly contradicts the commands of Jesus, who says, be alert and watch for these things. Right now, Calvary Chapel has had a de facto split. Chuck Smith's pulpit was hijacked by his son-in-law, 
who's now teaching against the teaching of Pu Chuck Smith publicly, saying we shouldn't teach about the end times, beat the drum of, of prophecy lower. Don't talk about this stuff. It hurts. It damages people. And so, so some of the other Calvary's are reacting. He, they, they, he resigned from the... He pulled Calvary Chapel across the Mesa out of the Calvary Chapel movement. It's splitting. False doctrine will bring division. Sometimes of necessity. If you don't amputate, you're going to die of gangrene or cancer. What is this truth? What is this surgical instrument? What is living and sharper than a two-edged sword? It is scriptural. Sorry about this. Scriptural. Not experiential. As soon as you hear somebody basing their doctrine on, I believe the Lord showed me. I believe the Lord put in my heart to tell you. And they don't back it up with Scripture. If they don't begin with Scripture as the premise, that's the sharp sword. It's not the living and active sharper than a two-edged sword. Secondly, the Word of God that's living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword is doctrinal. It is doctrinal. It's not relational. Let me show you how this works. The way Tony Campola, the sociologist, changed his position on homosexuality, a mother of a homosexual who was a Christian, whose son killed himself, called him up and talked to him. And he was a good boy. And all, that was his basis. How many, this is the Midwest, you have a lot of ex-Catholics. How many people used to be Roman Catholic? Look around goes like this. Oh, I know wonderful Catholic people who love the Lord. You shouldn't be critical of the Roman church. Yet take that Irish lady or that Hispanic lady or that Haitian lady or that Polish lady or that Italian lady on a deathbed with rosary beads, try not to go to purgatory, dying in fear, and call that love. No, the love of Jesus is to tell her the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. Perfect love casts out all fear. This is idolatry and superstition. It's a false gospel. You're not going to atone for your own sin in purgatory. He paid the price if you accept him. And they call it love. Oh, I know wonderful Catholics. So do I. I know people who were saved while in the Roman Catholic Church. Revelation 18.4, come out of her, my people. And that's not just Rome. That's liberal churches, etc. Doesn't say they're not his people. But because they are his people, he says, get out. Nobody says you can't be a Christian and be a Roman Catholic. But if you are a Christian, you will not stay a Roman Catholic. The Holy Spirit will show you to get out. Every time they pray to the dead, they're committing the sin of necromancy. Every time they worship the Eucharist, they're committing the sin of idolatry. The Holy Spirit's the spirit of truth and of holiness. He doesn't lead people to sin. I love Catholics. I have a Catholic mother on her way to hell because she trusts in a scapula instead of in the blood of Jesus. That's not love. People in my family are Jews and Catholics. They're lost because of a false Judaism, and they're lost because of a false Christianity. As soon as it becomes relational, I know wonderful people. In the, yeah, I met him, and he's a good man. And, oh. 
It's sharp as a two-edged sword. This is sharper. Truth is doctrinal, not relational. The Word of God is mysterious. It is not mystical. It is not mystical. There are mysteries in Scripture to be unveiled to the faithful. There are three main mysteries concerning the return of Jesus. We're planning a teaching on it. Paul calls them mysteries. One is the mystery of the rapture, 1 Corinthians 15. Two is the mystery of iniquity, 2 Thessalonians 2. Third is the mystery of Israel, Romans 11. He calls each a mystery. There are three mysteries concerning the return of Jesus that the faithful people of God must understand to prepare the way for Jesus to return and to be ready. It's mysterious, but it's not mystical. All this ethereal stuff, oh, I just see angels and I just... In the Bible, when they saw angels, they appeared, they, they, people could see them. It's, it's all this feeling, this is sensuality. This is mysticism. An emotionally charged mysticism. That was the Toronto deception, the Pensacola deception, the Bill Hybels, the, the Bill the Johnson. They're all nuts. Our faith is mysterious. It's not mystical. Saying that the Lord is, is, is like a blue genie. This is, this is mysticism. That's what they teach in Heibel's church. I'm not in uh, Johnson's church. Johnson, Heibel's no better. Let's look. God's truth. is theological. It is not philosophical. It's theological, it's not philosophical. Now there is biblical philosophy. Biblical philosophy is the book of Proverbs. I'm sorry, the book of Ecclesiastes, Kohelet. That's God's book of philosophy. There is biblical philosophy. If you want to understand God's philosophy of life, you know, the Greeks had the, the, Plato and, and Aristotle and then Socrates. The British had Beetham and, you know, and the Germans had Hegel and, 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 and Nietzsche and things like this. They all have their own philosophers. Well, God's philosopher was Solomon. Kohelet, the book of Ecclesiastes. Colossians warns us about the philosophies of the world. We live in a consumerist society that runs by marketing. That guy Peter Drucker, an unsaved Jew, influenced directly, directly he influenced the purpose-driven agenda. Rick Warren admits it. He got it from an unsaved secular guru, the philosophy of consumerism. It's based on consumerism. You go into TV commercials that only they, those TV stations and you have in America and Japan that they don't have any programming, they only have commercials. One commercial after another. Call the 800 number, send your visa. And you too can have this and you can have that. And it's, just call now, just claim it, it's yours. And we'll give you this for free. What do the money preachers do? They imitate it. They just, it's the philosophy. It's the philosophies of the world. It's not new, it goes back to Colossae. God's truth is theological. It's not philosophical, but it's sharp. People buy into it, it seduces, it drips honey. They know how to talk, they know how to get the money out of people. I don't mean money for missions and evangelism and helping the poor or helping the persecuted church. I mean mammon worship, where they call the sin of covetousness faith. Let's look. God's truth.
is exegetical. It's not asegetical. The modern patriarch, and I'm not attacking pre-tribulational people. Maybe some of you are pre-tribulational. I'm stating a fact. The modern patriarch, okay, Dr. John Wolverd, president of Dallas Seminary, admitted in his book on the rapture, there is no passage of scripture that teaches a pre-trib rapture. None. You can only base doctrine on what is exegetical, what you take out of scripture, not what you read into it. And so now people are saying things like, well, the Trinity is not directly stated either. That's music to the ears of a Jehovah's Witness. Read the martyrdom of Stephen. The Trinity is directly stated in Acts chapter 7. It's directly stated. It's, it's inherent in the Great Commission. But Jesus even explains the dynamic, the dynamic of the interaction of the three persons of the Godhead in John 14 through 17. It's directly taught. It's exegetically determined, the Trinity. Be careful of people Make a doctrine out of something. Now, if somebody's pre-trib, I think it's pre But you can't make a doctrine out of it unless you have a text that says it. You have to read something into the text. It doesn't say. They even admit it. But it appeals to people. Sure it does. Who wants to be persecuted? About three years ago, I was in Vietnam. You wouldn't believe what I had to deal with. Somebody took that Harold Camping's message, put it into the Hmong language. They broadcasted it on shortwave radio. Some Christians heard it, and they told other Christians. They thought Jesus was coming that day, he said. So they all went to a mountain to be raptured. The military police were there and killed over 100 of them. These Hmong pastors asked me when I got to Hanoi a couple of weeks later, maybe two weeks later, how come Jesus didn't come the way, the way Brother Campy said? You got people killed. These are just simple people, of course. They didn't know any better. They were being persecuted, and they wanted to get out of the persecution. They thought that was going to be it. Instead, they got knocked off. Camping did that. His board is, the blood of those people is on the hands of his board. We're not stopping that crazy man. But it drips honey. It's sharp. It appeals. Our faith. Is apostolic. Not patristic. The Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, and mainstream Protestantism. Episcopalian, Lutheran, Reformed, Calvinist, Presbyterian, all of that is patristic. If you read Calvin's Institutes, by the authority of Augustine, by the authority of Augustine, by the authority of Augustine had no authority. He had no authority. Augustine promoted infant baptism because Constantine pseudo-Christianized the Roman Empire, so every member of the, of the church is a citizen of the empire, and every citizen of the empire is a Christian, baptized it. This was Augustine. He changed one word and one verse to justify infant baptism on a grand scale. By the authority of Augustine! Without Augustine, there is no Calvinism or Lutheranism. There were people before the Reformation who always believed the gospel. In England, they were called the Lollards. In Central Europe, they were called the Bohemian Brethren who followed John Hus. Western Europe, they were called the Waldensians. There was always true believers. There was never a time when God didn't have a people for his name. <coughs> During the Reformation, there were people who really believed biblical Christianity. They were called Anabaptists, but they were persecuted, not just by the Catholics, but by the Protestants. You know the Mennonites they have here in Ohio? Pennsylvania, their ancestors 
were the ones who had it right in the 16th century, but the followers of Calvin and Lutheran persecuted them, even killed them, Zwingli drowned them. You want to be baptized again? We'll cut a hole in the ice and drown you. That's what the Protestants did to them. That's not to say everything the church fathers said was false, but it's not a basis of doctrine. Our faith is apostolic, not patristic. John Calvin repeatedly appealed to Jerome, to the Latin Bible, the Vulgate, not to the original Greek and Hebrew. Let's continue. Our faith is a matter of revelation, not indoctrination. The Jesuit philosophy of Roman Catholicism is the basis of the Roman Catholic school system. Give us a child to the age of seven and he's ours for life. It was designed to stop the spread of the gospel in the Counter-Reformation. By rote, repetition, catechism, they drummed these teachings into people so they would only think the way they were programmed to think from the time they were little kids. The rabbis do the same thing with what's called chemish, chemish. The, the, the uh, Talmudic interpretations of, of, of the five books of Moses, of the, of, of the Torah, they all do it. Well, there are plenty, plenty of born-again evangelical pastors who teach things and believe things only because they were taught it in seminary. The Holy Spirit never revealed it to them. Well, this is what I was always taught. I'm not premillennial because I was taught to be a millennial. That, that's the basis. The Holy Spirit didn't reveal it to them. <laughs> the Word of God is revelation. It's not indoctrination. You can see the fruit of this in a Bible belt. The Bible belt in Asia is South Korea. United States, it's the South and areas of the Midwest. East Africa, it's places like Kenya. Great Britain, where I live, it's Northern Ireland. Being an evangelical doesn't mean what you are. It means what you aren't. In a Bible Belt, it doesn't mean what you believe. It means what you don't. In Korea, it means I'm not a Buddhist. In East Africa, it means I'm not a Messiah, I'm a Kukuyu. <laughs> it goes by the tribe. Northern Ireland, it means I'm not a Catholic. <laughs> There's political evangelicism, tribal evangelicism, cultural evangelicism, but they're all based on indoctrination, not revelation. Now, the, the doctrines of the gospel may be there. Everybody in Alabama knows the gospel. It doesn't mean they're born again, does it? Let's continue. The Word of God is correct. It is not politically correct. How I long for the days when PC meant personal computer. Remember, Jesus went against the social and religious conventions of the day. He was not in any sense politically correct, nor were the Hebrew prophets. He took on the tradition of the elders, etc. Our faith is intellectually credible. That is defensible. It has an apologia. 
it is not intellectual. It's intellectually credible, but it's not intellectual. Having an intellectual grasp of the gospel does not save somebody. Now, unlike other religions, the gospel is intellectually defensible. Isaiah says, come let us reason together about man's sin. Paul says, our faith is reasonable. Islam is not reasonable. It's not reasonable to believe somebody that the Hadith says was a pedophile is a greater prophet than Jesus. It's not reasonable to be a Muslim. It's not reasonable to be a Mormon. This Quakers living on the moon, or Doctrines and Covenants, volume 14 of Brigham Young's Quakers on the moon. It's not reasonable to believe Mormonism. It's not reasonable. Those religions have no intellectual credibility. It's not reasonable to be a Hindu. Drink water from the Ganges and die of cholera, thinking it's holy. It's not reasonable. Our faith is reasonable. It is intellectually credible. There's empirical evidence for the claims of Jesus. It's intellectually defensible, but it's not intellectual. An intellectual faith never saved anybody. It's got to be here. If it's here, it'll also be here. But if it's here, that does not guarantee it's here. I'll say that again. If it's here, it'll also be here. Study to show yourself approved. But if it's only here, that doesn't mean it's here. Okay. Now, some people come to believe intellectually before they're regenerate, before they're born again. I accept that, but that's not salvation. You've got to take the next step. Now, be careful of anti-intellectualism. Be careful. Oh, it's all head knowledge. I don't need that Greek and Hebrew. I, I, I just have the revelation of the Spirit. Hallelujah. I don't need that Bible college. I don't need that seminary. What are you, scribes and Pharisees? Said the Lord. <laughs> the theologians of his day were known as the Sophrim, the scribes. Ezra was a scribe. Remember, Jesus not only said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, he said, I will send you scribes. Remember? I'll send you educated people. Experts in the texts and the languages. He said, I'll send them to you. And you'll persecute them. He also said, when a scribe, when a theologian becomes a disciple, when they get truly born again, they bring out of the treasury things old and things new. They had good teachers if they're born again. But if it's only head knowledge, if it's only intellectual, it's no good. But if they're born again, it's different. Look at the end of Peter's epistle. Those who distort the scripture. Let Paul explain these things, says Peter. Remember, Peter says, let Paul explain. I'm a fisherman. He was a rabbi. Let him. Look at his humility. He's the intellectual. Notice, the second generation of leaders in the church that God raised up, Apollos, Barnabas, Paul, they were more educated than the first. Study to show yourself approved. If the next generation of leaders is not more educated than the first, there's something wrong spiritually, you understand? Now, we're not pushing head knowledge. It's when a scribe becomes a disciple. Be careful of an intellectual faith, but be careful of an anti-intellectual faith. An intellectual faith usually reveals spiritual pride coming from superiority. And anti-intellectualism is also spiritual pride coming from inferiority. <laughs> Neither one are right. It's intellectually credible, but it's not intellectual and it is not anti-intellectual. I thank God as a young believer for the books of Francis Schaeffer, who answered the questions people of my hippie generation who had the revival that Jesus movement had. God used him at that time for people of my generation. He was an intellectual. Let's continue. Our faith. Our faith.
has criticality, not passivity. It has criticality, not passivity. Let's go back to our basic verse, Hebrews 4.12. Living and active, able to divide. That word divide in Greek is krites, krites. We get the word critical. When you say, that's not scriptural, that's wrong. Oh, you have a critical spirit. I certainly hope so. If you don't have a critical spirit, there's something wrong with you. They're confusing two different Greek words. There's krites and hypocrites. Now, what does hypocrites sound like? Hypocrite. People who go around fault-finding have something wrong with themselves. You understand? <laughs> We're not talking about fault-finding, but we are talking about the objective examination of something. Is it scriptural or not? Is it doctrinally tenable or not? We are commanded to do that. It's not an option. You have a critical spirit. I certainly thank God I do. I hope you do too. It's not that if you don't have a critical spirit, you're going to be deceived. Don't worry about that. I'm not saying that if you don't have a critical spirit, you're going to be deceived. If you don't have a critical spirit, you've been deceived already. It's too late for that. Criticality, not passivity. I remember doing that counterfeit revival in, up in Toronto, and I listened to a tape, and that honored guy was saying, it's just like a river. Don't think about it. Just trust God and jump into it. Who in their right mind is going to go on a dock without knowing the depth and dive in? You might break your neck. Scriptural Christianity has criticality, not passivity, not passivity. It is contextual. It is not monotextual. Think of the temptation narrative of Jesus in Matthew 4. Satan was monotextual, for it is written. Jesus is contextual and cotextual, for it is also written. Deceivers can find the verse to say anything. Just look at the Catholic thing. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot have life. Keep reading. The flesh profits nothing. Less than 10 verses later, the socks profits nothing. Doesn't matter if you go to communion. I guarantee you Jesus is going to wind up in the Columbus sewage system in a few hours. It's ridiculous. His blood's going to come through your bladder. The flesh profits nothing. What I'm going to give endures forever. He's speaking of belief anyway. You can get our teachings on John 6, what he was really saying, in context and in context. Be careful. Every cult, every false religion, they are always monotextual. Judge not! They love that one. Someone living immorally. Judge not. If the word of God says something is wrong, that's not us judging, it's God's judgment. <laughs> Judge was right judgment. It is contextual. It's not monotextual. Let's continue. It is again the logos. When we pray, we talk to the Lord. When we read his word, he talks back to us. 
the first and foremost way God speaks to us by His Spirit is through reading Scripture. When you read Scripture, Jesus is talking to you. It is not what Peter calls the pseudo logos. When you read the Watchtower, Jesus is not talking to you. When you read the Koran, he's not talking to you. Unbelievable. Our faith. Is pure. In Greek, catharsis. In Hebrew, tahor. Tahor. Pure truth is aligned with a pure heart in biblical Hebrew thought. It's not creating me a clean heart, O Lord. That's not what it says in Psalm 51. It says, Lev tahor brali Elohim. Create in me a pure heart. What does that mean? No mixture. It's easy to put this in Greek, but I'll just write no mixture. The Greek is easier to explain. Parasogzusin. They put truth next to error. Oh, the Jehovah's Witnesses say some true things. The Roman Catholic Church says some true things. Yeah, camouflage. Oh, there's some true things in the purpose drift. God's word is pure. It's not a mixture. It is orthodox. Not heterodox. There is no new doctrine. There is in the last days for the faithful a clearer understanding of the doctrine already in there. Seal these things up to the time of the end. There will be an illumination, a clearer understanding of what's in there. But there's no new doctrine. Be careful of people who have a new teaching. The word apocalyptic in Greek means unveiling. I've explained this before. In the last days for the faithful church and the faithful believers, the closer we get to the return of Jesus, the more the veil goes up. You understand? We see clearer. For the harlot church, for the apostate church that goes into Babylon, the veil goes down. They see less and less. In the last days, understanding of God's word becomes the barometer of faithfulness. Remember Proverbs 31, the faithful bride? Her lamp does not go out at night. Remember? My words are lamp to my feet, a light to my path. The faithful bride, that faithful bride, the same as the harlot, is a picture of the false religion. The faithful one in Proverbs 31 is a picture of the true church, the true bride. Her lamp does not go out at night. Proverbs, uh, Matthew 25, the wise virgin. Our faith is orthodox, not heterodox. Our faith the meaning is objective, not subjective. Many people meet in homes because they can't find a good church or they try to form a home church, which I agree with. The problem is, something I've seen happening in these groups is they read a passage and discuss it. And they all share. This is what it means to me. This is what it means to me. <laughs> it becomes a subjective meaning. No, there's an objective meaning. Anything subjective that the Lord may apply to your own life or circumstances must be based on what's objectively inherent doctrinally. You understand? When you get into subjective meaning, you begin spiritualizing texts out of context. That's Gnostic. It's Gnosticism.
One more. Our faith is proto-linguistic. It is not retro-linguistic. Turn with me, please, to Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8. Nehemiah 8, 8. This is the only verse in Scripture, the only verse, something that God only saw a need to say once. He didn't see any need to address it further. He said it once and only once. The people came back from Babylon, speaking Chaldee. Syriac alphabet, they developed the Hebrew dialect of Chaldee, Aramaic, or Hebrew dialect of Aramaic, but only the Levites and the old people still knew Hebrew. Chapter 8, verse 8, and they read from the book, the Torah, that is the scroll, the Megillah, from the law of God translating or explaining to give the sense so they understood the teaching. Now this is a loaded verse and we can derive much from it and we do so in other teachings, but look what it says. The priority is on the original meaning of the original language. The priority is the original meaning of the original language, not a translation. I have no problem with the King James Bible, but let no one tell you it does not contain errors. It does. When you see these people saying, that a 17th century translation of a translation is the authoritative text. That is garbage. God gave his word in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. The New Testament quotes usually the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, sometimes makes reference to Aramaic text or what we would call the Masoretic, something close to it. I can show you where the King James deviates in both Greek and Hebrew from the Textus Receptus and from the Masoretic. I had a guy once, he said, I said, read this. If I forget the old Jerusalem and my right hand forget its cunning. I read it in Hebrew. What do you mean forget its cunning? It's not in there. That's not the implication of it. Yes, it is. It's in the King James. But it's not in the Hebrew. Yahweh will bring salvation with his right hand. What he's saying is, if he forgets his covenant promises to Israel and, and Jerusalem, he can forget his own son. It calls the Holy Spirit an it. It calls the day of resurrection Easter. It has mistakes. Did God use it? Yes. I love it for its prose, but it is not the priority. The priority is the original meaning of the original languages. That is what is living, active, and sharper than a two-edged sword. These Ruckmanite people are crazy. Ruckman actually taught things contained in the 1611 edition of the King James Bible not found in the original languages are further revelation. That makes him a heretic according to the, the book of Revelation chapter 22. Our faith is proto-linguistic. It is not retro-linguistic. Those are the differences between a sharp sword, a sharp double-edged sword, and something that is living, active, and sharper than a double-edged sword. They've all got a sharp double-edged sword. They've all got a sharp sword. We need something that is living and active, and that is sharper. These are its characteristics. There's a wonderful verse in Scripture. I'll translate it from the Hebrew. Chesed mishamayim nishkaf, amet ma'aretz tishmoch. Chesed 
ve'amet nishkachu. Grace and peace have kissed each other. But what it says is, hesed mishamayim nishkaf. The grace from heaven, the upper lip. It's like a kiss. Va'amet ma'aretz. The truth from the earth. Titzmok. Chesed ve'amet nishkahu. Grace and truth. Grace and truth. Jesus never compromised truth in the name of graciousness. He told the woman at the well, salvation comes from the Jews, you've got it wrong. He told the Syrophoenician woman, I can't give the children's bread to dogs, which you believe is unfit for human consumption. But he showed her grace. Grace and truth kiss. It's, in Hebrew, it's anomanopia. You know what I mean? It's hard, not easy to translate exactly. But it's very beautiful. Grace and truth have kissed each other. That's the two-edged sword. One side is grace. The other side is truth. Only ours is sharper than theirs. God bless and thank you for listening. That was rich. Amen. That was good. Thank you, brother. Man, I'd like to call Pastor John Haller up here. We're going to pray for Jacob. They're going to hit the road later this afternoon. I think you're going to... Where are you headed? We're going to pray for his safety, and uh, again, I believe the Lord's going to work through all of the things that he shared with us today. So, John, you want to? Yeah, and if you want, uh, are you teaching Wednesday night in DeVore? Yes. Okay. Sergio is teaching, too. Serge is teaching, isn't he? Yeah. So, there'll be a little conference in DeVore, and then I think next Saturday, they'll be live streaming yeah. from DeVore. So, you don't even have to get up early because it's California time yeah. and <laughs> and everything, too. So, and, um, we'll be doing... Christmas, Hanukkah, and return of Christ and death. <laughs> so let's pray. And um, Lord, uh, we thank you so much for our brother Jacob and um, the things that uh, you've seen fit to let him teach us and others. We pray that you will bless him. Pray you'll give him safe travel today. Pray you'll keep him healthy, help him deal with his issues and just watch over him and protect him and and David Lister as well as they uh, get around the country and minister to others. We thank you so much uh, for this servant and bless him. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to say that this church is affiliated with Boreal. If you are in the general area of Columbus and you are churchless and need a church, we'd certainly recommend this one. You are welcome with open arms and the love of Jesus. Amen. This church amen. endeavors to have grace and truth. Give me a big kiss. <laughs>